later tonight because uh, I am told some of you will have some remarks later tonight so it's only fair but I think now we're going to be devoted to education and what's the greatest thing about being a BTA attorney no accounts receivable if I don't bill you I don't have to worry about it okay it, it's wonderful no collection letters I had to, my father was a dentist and my father paid for my law school which was nice of him and I used to once in a while have to do collections for him. And I have the greatest letter that I've ever written in my career. And it says, my name is Bob Goldberg, I'm Harold Goldberg's son. And my dad paid for my law school education and raised me. And he has asked me to collect this debt from you. And I have to. <laughs> and I will be relentless until I receive a check from you. Please understand, Thanksgiving is coming up. And at that dinner, he's going to ask me. <laughs> and, and, and they call me up laughing, you know. <laughs> and I've never had a letter like that. Well, Greg uh, doesn't do collection work for me either. Um, what I'd like you to do, first of all, those are, first of all, on mine, that's my personal email my cell phone, um, which I will continue to monitor 24-7 until the day they say goodbye to me. Well, so if you have questions, if you want to talk, if you want to visit. There are so many wonderful friends here, but we'll get into that tonight, okay? But that's my personal email, my cell phone number, and I always encourage you, and I reach out, please call and let me know what's on your mind, anything I can do to help. If it's a BTA-related event, you have Greg Goldberg, and when I put that up there, initially I put his office number up there, what, where to call him in Los Angeles, where Greg's located, he said, no, no, Dad, I want, want my cell phone. I want to be available to dealers like you were. So Greg and I will be, can, well, Greg will take over July 1st. Thank you very much. And um, I am very confident that he can carry on the tradition of the excessive benefit of legal benefit that BTA provides. But let's talk about, about your birthday there in the email address, Bob. That's absolutely correct. RCG, you, figured, you, you didn't figure that one out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, 420, April 27th. That's correct. That is my birthday. That works out. It, 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 I came up with something I could remember. All right. <laughs> Let, let's look at the industry, an industry in transition. What's happening in our industry? And I'm excited. You know, I, I, I hear people, well, first of all, Todd Johnson gets up and gives us statistical information that's just breathtaking. Oh, really, the, the amount of knowledge that man has regarding our industry, the trends and the benchmarks are just incredible. It's something we all should be very closely attuned to. But, you know, you get up and you hear those dots on the top of the chart that are making money and extreme profits. There is a lot of opportunity in this industry, okay? Everyone is doing well, everyone should continue to do well, and everyone should go home, as Mark King told us, with a vision and a mission and, and something to strive for and to gain. Just incredible. So, what's happening? I'm back at 23, at least 30 dealer acquisitions that, that took place that I was aware of in 2023. I'm sure there's a number that we weren't involved in that, didn't, that we didn't know about, but that's a lot. You heard, Todd, interest rates are up. It sort of put a damper on some of the VC companies that are doing the roll-ups, but there are a lot of transitions. We closed two last month. Um, there's some in the hopper. I, I have up there, as I believe, five to 10 million as the sweet spot. It's even a little lower than that now. There's a lot of people looking to exit. Um, they don't want to make the investment. They think they missed the top of the bell curve. They're concerned. Um, whether or not they'll be able to get their equity out of the business and someone will be there to buy it from them. So dealer buying dealer, you heard it's sort of a bargain, okay? I, I heard Todd say we don't pay each other as much as some of the VC companies do. So if you're looking to expand, you want to increase your MIP, it's something nearby, it's a great opportunity. Um, you eliminate a competitor and you take on an increased machine base. So it's there. Um, several in the pipeline, multiples are down. I look at, I see four and a half to five and a half these days. Um, I had one in 23 at seven. 
Um, so, you know, things have changed. The market has changed. What else has changed? Well, I used to have just Rico and Toshiba up there. Laura, I'm sorry, I've got Fuji and Konica up there. Thank you for adding to my story. Um, I appreciate very much. But, but there's a message here. There's a message in what's happening among our suppliers and the OEMs. Um, yes, maybe production exceeds demand, so there's consolidation taking place. You consolidate the manufacturing. Um, you know, Rico had what, Stetner, had Lanier, had Rico. You know, you just you, you tape on the right name at, at, you know, when, it, when you go to install it, right? You make sure you got the right one on. But, you know, there's a message there. They, they are shrinking in terms of the manufacturing capabilities because it exceeds the demand, and they're um, t putting together their research and development, um, and you'll see more of this, and you saw it with, with Fuji and Konica. So, the, in the RICO deal, it's 85 versus 15, so it's not exactly a 55th. Fuji, we haven't seen the numbers. Somebody will leak them one of these days soon, and we'll find out what they are and how it is. I'm, I'm looking at you <laughs> affectionately. Um, <laughs> There'll be dealer overlap. I have up there Coridio White. You make the choice. Maybe they'll both be around, or maybe you know we'll have a, an election November seventh and find out which one of them wins. Um, I don't know. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, look what happens with Xerox, HP, Kyocera. Where, where are they going? Um, you just don't know. But look at the direction. What are, what are they investing in our OEMs? They're investing in software applications and software companies, and I think you should be looking at those opportunities as well. They're look, they have their five-year plan, their 10-year plan. Um, you know, we have our five-minute and 10-minute plan, um, and it's just basically how long the bar line is. Um, but you know, they're, look to see what your suppliers are doing, see where they see the industry going, see if they can help you with direction as to what's the proper course to take and a lot of it is in software applications and software solutions. So I, I'm, I'm heavy on those, and I think that's a good place to be looking. Business objectives. We hear all this thing about transitioning. I heard Todd say, what, 7% was the profit or whatever it was in terms of IT sales? Well, you know, make, everyone's talked about, you gotta get into IT, you gotta get into IT. Um, you know, and I, and I know, look what Dex buys companies and they have an IT division, they sell it off and just stick with the equipment part of it, okay? Um, I don't know what the answer is there, but I know IT hasn't been successful for everyone. I know that it takes three to five years sometimes just to ramp up and get hopefully to a break even point. I know that there's a lot more education, a lot more difficulty in terms of serving your IT base. So look at it and make your decision. Is that the direction to go? In Bob's world, it's a little different. Ask your customers what their problems are. Listen to your customers. Learn from them and plan. You know, misery means margin. In misery, I always tell this story. I live in Glencoe, Illinois, outside Chicago. We let our dog out in the backyard all winter long. In the spring, when the snow melts, we find droppings that, that have been left. I'm perfectly capable of picking up those droppings. There's no problem. There's a scooper. We have it. I, I could use it, but there's somebody who will do it for me, okay? <laughs> misery, misery. I would rather pay him to pick it up than have me do it, okay? Find the misery, make it a mystery, and get the margins that are there. It always works out well. Maintain, grow your base, diversification, and most importantly, look around this room. And we have some phenomenal vendors here who I, I went to every booth today, I stopped by, I said hello, thank people for being here. And I saw people who wanted to be your trusted partner. Um, they're not your vendor, they're your partner in how to solve issues, how to find solutions, how to make more money, how to grow together. And that's very, very important. When we go back 47 years and we had one-sided contracts where you know, if you did anything wrong, they can terminate you with or without cause at any time. Um, it, they, we didn't have trusted partners. We've come during these five decades to a point, and you'll see in my next column, where we've gone from the courtroom to the conference room to work out differences, okay? 
So look at these vendors that are here. These are trusted partners. They have solutions. They want you to grow, and they will help you grow along the way. So those are there too. Find the misery, develop the expertise, advise, consult. I look at all of these things like AI. You know, you've got Wes McDonald re reinvented himself into AI, okay? You did some things before this, but he has become an expert and authority that I look to and most of you look to in terms of what the future is. This man, you can ask him anything and he has a, a, an idea of which way it's going, how to help you, how to implement it. I would want to be, as a trusted advisor, an expert in, in, in artificial intelligence because everyone's talking about it. You can help your customers understand it and perhaps grow into it and perhaps find some of these software applications that can help. Um, you all heard right. Siri is now going to have artificial intelligence from ChatGPT. You know, have you all used ChatGPT? You know, I, I, I got to admit it. I, I put in a few inquiries and got a, a skeleton of an idea to work from, and it's very, very effective. You can use that, become the trusted advisor, and move into it with your customer base. Um, you have to come to BTA for education. Come to BTA at these events, and we're constantly looking at how to improve them, how to change them, how to bring more value to you, how to answer the issues and the questions that you have, and we're doing that, and you'll find that both in San Antonio, um, in, in uh, uh, Asheville, and in uh, my, uh, not, uh, Orlando. Orlando, thank you, the Grand Floridian, the Mickey, <laughs> it's such a Mickey Mouse place, yeah. <laughs> okay? But you know what's most important here is the opportunity to network, is to speak with each other, okay? Um, go back 47 years when Jim Ayers at Gilson Ayers in Troy, Michigan came to a meeting and said he started putting MPS on the bottom of every single invoice that, that he sent out in his company. And he trained everyone how to answer when they got those irate phone calls that there was a 25 MPS charge on the bottom of the invoice. Now, what did MPS stand for back in the 1980s? Miscellaneous parts and supplies that he couldn't identify. He said, I went through, we had meetings with the staff, we told them how to respond, we told them what it was, it was the little things that we just don't inventory that much, but they go into every deal. We didn't get one call. I have X thousands of service calls a year, and now every one of them gives me another 25 cents to the bottom line. And he shared that with everyone, everyone who was in the meeting. There are things to be shared here. Um, who was uh, Kevin Marshall at the board meeting yesterday said, I came to one meeting and I found out if you advertise for technicians through handyman, you'll get all kinds of responses and potential people. And I've been doing it and it's been working. I picked that up at a BTA event, I picked it up through networking. So let's continue that. Um, if you're looking, Mark Hart's here, I hope he's still here, he didn't, he didn't around, okay, maybe not. But there's been a lot of talk about electric vehicle chargers. Now there's a piece of equipment and there's service that goes along with it, okay? Is it something you wanna look at and get into? Well, the Inflation Reduction Act gets the government to pay a large portion of that. So everyone's looking at improving the environment, improving operations. Some of you may be going to electric vehicles for your fleets. Um, Domino's did it, right? We heard how great Domino's was. Their pizza didn't get better, just their marketing and everything. <laughs> There's not, it's, it's fine. You, you know, Mark King did not get up here and say, what did he say? food cravings or something. Yeah. You go to Taco Bell when you're drunk and you need grease in your stomach. <laughs> when was the last time you said, I want to go to Taco Bell? You have to be half out of it. <laughs> <laughs> These are true things. These people have to get up here and tell us the truth. All right. Businesses get money, licensing requirements. That's an opportunity. Look at it. There are people in this room who have gotten an EV charger through ACDI and are being successful in it. Are they making a million overnight? No, but it's part of that road. The IT road, three to five years, maybe, maybe EVs one to three years. I don't know the answer, but there's people here you can network with and get the answers for that. I also want to encourage you in an industry in transition 
to bring in an outside director to your board of directors, okay? An outside director is someone who can come in and looks, it's the paradigm shift, all those things, thinking outside the box, everything else we've always talked about. They bring in the outside director, have them look at your business, have them interchange with you, have them be part of, of the future and the planning that goes on. Um, don't get your lawyer and don't get your accountant, okay? <laughs> no, I'm serious. They're looking to maintain the relationship and not upset you. They're not necessarily going to be there and say, you got to cut this cost and increase this revenue and do this. You can't do that. It's against the law. You don't want that person. You want maybe somebody in a related industry that sells through distribution or buys someone else's product and resells it and does it and put them on. If you're, you'll, you'll have to understand that um, you should have officers and directors insurance. They'll ask for that. Um, you know, if I go on a board, I always ask you have DNO insurance, and, and they if they say yes, then I'm I'm prepared to go on. So that's something you might have to look in as well. If you're not comfortable putting them on your board of directors, create an advisory board, a group that gets together once a month, sits down, talks about things, looks at the various issues, and helps you. Don't get just pigeonholed into your business. Make sure you have the opportunity to get outside thoughts. Get outside thoughts here. Um, it'll work well. Okay, cybercrime. It's been fantastic opportunity, cybercrime. Um, here's another place where you, as a trusted advisor, can help your customer. <laughs> Everyone, you, there's not a, a week that goes by that you don't hear of a major ransomware effect, a major breach somewhere that's taken place. And these are big companies that it's happening to. Companies you would expect should be more sophisticated and not have those problems. So you can help your customers through an explanation. Trillion dollar, 44%, um, these are old statistics because we don't, I don't have any from 2023 yet, uh, up 50%, and that's reported. I know a lot that aren't reported, okay? I know some among you who were breached that weren't reported. So I know when I've gotten those calls what the difficulty's been. Um, fueled by remote workers, 475 million ransom paid. If you're a small business, you should be telling them they should have perhaps 10% of their budget towards cyber insurance as well as the firewall and all the other practices that are, that are required under the insurance policy. Boy, I wouldn't want one too far. Okay. Um, these are just a lot of things that you need to consider when you're involved with um, cyber insurance and requirements that, go that, that the insurance companies demand in order to get compensated for any loss. But these are also educational opportunities for you as a trusted advisor. Um, make sure that um, you're educating your customer. You look at the security, the backup, phishing education. I think, I don't know if any of you have offered that or go in and send out, you know, those ridiculous emails and put on an attachment. You know how many times people click on that? I gotta tell you, at, at our firm now, I've gotta go through Mindcast for almost every single document that comes in, which is a two-factor examination before they'll give me authorization to even open it. And the jerks have right at the end, is it, do you believe this is safe? And you have to click, I believe it's safe. So in other words, when it's not safe and their system failed, I'm the one who said it was safe, not them, right? Okay, and, and I, you don't, it's so frustrating you have to go through it, but it's necessary. You know about malware, say, patch updates, intrusion, block websites, um, two-factor login, we'll talk about it. It's required under the cyber insurance uh, policies. Oh, and a response plan test. Most of these cyber insurance company policies require that you have a plan in place if there is a breach, a suspected breach, what takes place, what gets done. It's a written plan. Um, they vary from company to company, but you can easily go on the internet and find a few examples to look at. And if you're using an insurance broker, they'll give you one as well. Now there's two places where you're going to need cyber insurance, okay? You're gonna need it to cover your own business in case you get breached. And it's happened to dealers, let's, let's face it. We're organizations, we have computers, we have iPhones, we have 
mobile phones, we have iPads, tablets, whatever it's going to be, and they're vulnerable. And, and there are dealers who've gotten breached and there have been ransom demands made, so you need insurance for that. Insurance for, for your policy should be, you're the first party that's going to be uh, responsible or, or going to be covered on this. Attorney notification and regulatory obligations. Um, there are notifications that must be given. They must be given within a certain time period. And if you fail to do that, they'll deny the claim. It's, let me tell you, they, they look at every conceivable way to deny a claim that's possible. It's frightening. Um, you buy this insurance, you're in good hands, right? Until you have a claim, okay? Then you're not. Um, you need recovery or placement of your lost data. Notification to customers if it takes place. And I gotta tell you, that's where we get hiccups in our industry. What do you wanna do, tell your customers you've been breached after you've been selling them IT services and assuring them that they'll never have that problem because of your expertise? Um, that, that's been, become problematic. You'll have lost income, business interruption, crisis management and public relations, uh, the extortion, the amount, Forensic services are most expensive, and you'll have fees, fines, and penalties. Every state has implemented that um, as part of the notice requirement. So when you're looking at cyber insurance, technology cyber insurance um, for your business, um, these are factors that you want to make sure are covered. Now the third, now the, what about your customers? And you can be innocent. You're taking a print device, an A3, an A4, and hooking it up to the network, right? What if the breach comes through that device into their network and you're the one who did the connection and put it, put it together? They're gonna to come after you. You're going to be one of the people. And that is a huge problem, especially for us that are doing IT services. You get the call, we think there's a breach, you go out and try to help shut it down, get the backup um, secure, go in and try to get everything under control. And then as the process continues, the insurance company, and we'll see other slides, start pointing to third parties or this or that that may be liable, and there's some point where that comes up for you as well. But for the third party, payment to consumers, they may be um, involved, they may have consumers that have part of their information breached. And people ask me, what should be the limit of my cyber insurance policy, okay? Take your 10 biggest customers, Try to figure out how much revenue they have on, on a daily basis and take that amount times the 10 for each for a one day's lost revenue and you get an idea of perhaps what it is. So if you're dealing with a Fortune 100 company, it might be a tremendous <coughs> number, it might be a smaller number for others, depending what your base is. Uh, claims, settlements, and expenses should be covered. Losses for defamation, copyright, trademark infringement, Regulatory and accounting costs are all things that should be covered under the policy that you should look for. Now here's the policy requirements, and, and this is most important, and where you come in and you can make uh, help as a trusted advisor and revenue as well. The policies require, number one, of course, a firewall. Well, did you put in the firewall, or did their college kid who came home for spring break put it in because he's tech savvy? Right, okay, um, that's always something to look at. So firewall, multi-factor authentication is, is just a minimum now. Um, we all know we have the two-factor that goes in and how many of us are getting codes back that you have to put the code in next to make sure you are who you say you are. If you don't have these things, your policy won't cover you. Um, endpoint management, security training, they, they, the policies require that there be security training for your employees, um, and of course, backup. Ransoms by the server, um, and you want technology errors and emissions coverage. Some of your brokers may say errors and emissions, but you want technology errors and emissions. That's the key word in terms of the policy and insurance that you're looking for. It should call, cover, um, the cost of the impact network, business interruption, data recovery, and of course, defense costs, that's the lawyers, and they have their own firms that they recommend that you hire and get involved, because there's all kinds of notice and requirements. Have a breach hotline so that you can call 24-7 for any issues. 
Um, and then you're gonna have to demonstrate to the insurance company um, that you were in fact taking due care in terms of complying with the policy. And you as the trusted advisor for your third party, your customer might be the one that provides that documentation that they had two party authentication, that they did have security training, that they did do certain things. So the actual ransom only 25% of the claim, here's how they don't pay them. Poor prevention policy, no good concrete written prevention policy. Third party at fault, remember when I told you we pointed each other that that can come up and you fail to meet the time frames. These policies require notice to the insurance company, some of them 48 hours, 72 hours. They want to know right away because they want to get in and eradicate the loss and, and, and the potential loss. So if you miss that, you wait a four days, I'm not sure, they'll say, we're not going to cover you. It's not going to be there. Premiums are skyrocketing. You all know that. Uh, BTA has been looking at a company. I was working with uh, one of the vendors, actually. MPS Monitor was looking for certain coverages, and I put them in. in I found a guy in New York who is like the epitome, and I've been talking to him about whether or not he'd come and speak to us and have a policy that we could all, you know, uh, take on that's been reviewed that everyone had. So I, I, I'm working on that. BTA is working on it. We'll continue to work on it. Um, you can provide education, the compliance assessment, and the compliance documentation. I've reviewed many, 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 many policies and found AIG, Hartford, Berkshire Hathaway, and Chubb have about the best policies. What you want to look for when you get the policy is the exclusions page, what they won't cover, and that's the key, what they won't cover. 